Blockchain is often referred to by experts as the technology of the future. And we have been seeing its rising adoption by firms over the years. But as the demand for the technology grows, so are the job opportunities in the space. My chat with blockchain enthusiast Mudukpa TV explores the use of the technology for economic development. Thank you so much for joining us on the program. It's a pleasure to be here. As per your knowledge, what is blockchain and why does it matter? Okay, so a blockchain simply defined is a database. I like to describe it as a database or maybe a list of transactions that is created or developed and then maintained using two interesting concepts. The first is the concept of decentralization. And then the second is that it is protected by cryptography. Does that sound a bit confusing? Well, decentralization simply means that there's no central authority. So not one person is in charge and everybody can contribute to that list or to that database. And then cryptography simply means code. It's just like when I speak in a coded language and you can't get the information except you know the code. So that's what a blockchain is, simply put. Now, blockchain matters because if something goes wrong in a centralized setting, everybody suffers. The question can come up and you say, but we've been living like this for so long. Why do we need blockchain? We've been managing centralized situations and you know we've been okay. Why do we need decentralization? Now, Forbes published a report in 2018 where they said that very soon, nobody will trust any information that is not on the blockchain. So change is constant and is consistent. And if that's where the world is going to, then we have to jump on the bandwagon. We have to be prepared. We have to get ready because I believe that blockchain is the future of skill. And so everyone who doesn't have any information about blockchain should make plans to you know, get some knowledge on it because that's the future. We're beginning to see the government show more interest in the use of blockchain for economic development and innovation. Do you think we're ready for the long haul? Honestly, I don't think we're ready, but we should be. We should be because right now in Nigeria, a country of nearly 200 million people, we have maybe less than 10 to 15% of the population who are aware about the blockchain technology. And then of this 10 to 15%, maybe 90% are only aware about cryptocurrencies and the use of cryptocurrencies. So this in itself shows you that, you know, we're not really ready because cryptocurrencies are just one aspect and one area of the technology. So I believe that we're not ready, but we should be. So we should be working towards that. Now, we know that Nigeria is yet to have a clear court blockchain policy but are there frameworks that can serve as enablers of blockchain and you know, other emerging technologies in the country? Oh yeah, definitely. I know that a few months ago, the SEC released the regulatory framework for VSSPs, which is the virtual asset service providers. And the idea was to be able to reduce the actions of you know, bad actors in the sector to make sure that they include compliance in their business transactions. So that has happened. Then on a global scale as well, the Financial Action Tax Force has also released the Travel Rule Protocol. So this also is to curb the idea where people believe that cryptocurrencies are all about illegal transactions. Because I know that when compliance comes into play, then people are more careful and then um, there should really be no reason why it shouldn't be reg regulated. Also, I know that the first blockchain hub in Nigeria is actually part of many, many, many blockchain um, and investigation um, and um, regulatory frameworks around the world. He's part of building these frameworks. And I know that he serves in some advisory roles to people from the CBN and the SEC. So you see that there's a lot of work going on in that sector, preparing regulations. And I think it's timely because we should be ready to make sure that people can be compliant to regulations that are coming to play. When we talk about blockchain, you know, we mentioned Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies. How are they disrupting financial services? Oh, you see, one major disruption I can think about right now is the fact that we cannot um, interact with cryptocurrencies with our banks in Nigeria at moment, 
but that didn't slow down anything. So that is major disruption of the financial sector. The peer-to-peer -peer system put into place by the decentralized exchanges and all that ensure that people were still trading. You can't use the banks, but people were still trading. People were still, you know, making their money, receiving payments. What could be more disruptive than that? So you see, this is a major disruption of the financial sector. And is it and is it safe to say blockchain is also solving the problem of financial inclusion? Oh, most definitely. You see, right now, even the currently unbanked can use the blockchain technology and receive payments. And it's not just about trading cryptos, looking for uh, you know how to multiply your money quickly. There's a particular um, situation I know in one of the Eastern African countries um, where uh, the farmers have been able to use blockchain to get rid of intermediaries in their supply chain. So they, from where they are, contact or connect with their off-takers directly in different countries around the world. And they receive their payments via blockchain. Interestingly, they don't even have smart devices. So they get SMS notifications, and then there's a smart contract in place that converts their payments from the cryptocurrency into their local value. They see it, and then they can cash their funds for maybe like a local mobile money agent or something. And so that is financial inclusion for people who are currently unbanked. And it's going on around the world in many third world countries as well. What are some of the challenges hampering the adoption of blockchain tech? I think the biggest thing is the volatility of the cryptocurrencies. So while we have a, a lot of people with a good appetite for risk and they can get involved. There's still a lot of people that are scared. And what is it? You say it's digital, it's on the internet. What does it mean? Can I hold it? Can I handle it? So the intangibility as well, it's a bit of a problem for people. Also bad actors, you know, people think that cryptocurrencies are the biggest loophole for fraud and investigation and money laundering. But if you look at statistics properly, the largest cases of fraud, money laundering are still with cash, are still not using cash. So whichever system, there could still be loopholes. Another thing that I think is that people don't, it's, it's a knowledge problem, the knowledge gap. Because if people understood blockchain and the technology better, they would know that every blockchain transaction, every cryptocurrency transaction can be tracked. And when we know that it can be tracked, Bad actors, you know, definitely take a step step back. There are fraud and investigation units right now that can track and trace your transactions. You don't even need to be a fraud investigator, really. You just log on to the internet and it's there because it's open source. It's available for everybody to see. When it comes to the male to female ratio in the blockchain space, there is still a huge gap between both genders. How can we enable more women become active members of the ecosystem? Yes. Um, there's still less than 10% um, involvement of females in blockchain. And the major reason that I see is not like the other employment sectors. Because for other employment se sectors, people say, oh, reduce or lower the barriers to entry. When it comes to blockchain, it's decentralized. So there's really no barriers to entry. So why do women still not get involved? And I think the, the most important thing is a knowledge gap that people can understand that the, the, the remote working options that are available and then take advantage of them. They don't, you don't need to go anywhere. You can study in blockchain from wherever you are. You don't need a university degree. So for whatever it is, uh, maybe your, whatever area you're currently involved and working in, all you have to do is to upskill in that area, put in some Web3 or blockchain knowledge on it, and then you can get employed even remotely and begin to work in it. So I think for women to get more involved, it's just knowledge. For them, identifying better with the knowledge, understanding it better, understanding the technology better, and then knowing how to deploy and implement it. Oh, thank you so much for joining us on the program. You're welcome. Thank you so much for the opportunity.